rapper, entrepreneur, and label head, Pusha T redefined the sound of the streets and then went on to become the head of Kanye West Good Music. This is his blueprint. So how did you meet Chad and Pharrell? We all lived minutes within each other, but all because of zoning went to different schools. We had a mutual friend and my brother at the time was rhyming with Timbaland. They would all, them being older, Pharrell, my brother, they would all go down to the ocean front and, you know, just rhyme in a circle. He just came out and was like, listen, your brother, that's Gene. That's your brother. And I'm like, yeah. He was like, man, he's so nice. I want him to work with me. Like, I want him to rap with me, you know, so on and so forth. And I was like, oh, okay. Timbaland leaving, going to work with Jodeci and all of that is what made room for my brother and Pharrell to connect. You got into the music probably in the middle of high school? Yeah, definitely. I would say middle of high school. We'd get up in the morning, we'd skip school, we'd go to Chad's house. We'd take Chad's house over all day until about three o'clock. That's when his, his mother would come home. Rapping and songwriting was like, was everything that was going on in that house. And I wasn't doing any of it. I was just sitting there just soaking it up, saying what's hot, what's not, what you probably shouldn't say that. So how did you get your skills up? One day I just picked up a pen. I was like, man, I'm gonna write me a verse. And everybody liked it. And, and my brother, would take so long to write three verses. Pharrell was like, y'all should just be like Cain and Abel, y'all brothers, y'all nice, y'all dark skin, y'all two dark skin brothers, nobody's done this. And then he just, his wheels just started turning. At the same time, you're doing other things that yeah. are business related. Can, can you tell me, <laughs> you know, some of the uh, illegal activities that you were involved with, how they sort of impacted your thinking about how business works? Well, at the time, you know, the drug culture was so heavy just in where, where I lived at. It was a thing of what, that was just what the kids did. That was, that was the mischief. At that time, man, you just really needed to show and prove. You needed to have money. You had to have money. You had to go get it. You had to, you wanted to live. You wanted to see things. You wanted to do things. You wanted to have things. And that was the only way to do it. My brother being five years older than me, the big difference was it was cool for them to rap. By the time I got in high school, it wasn't really cool for me to say that like I'm a rapper or I'm like, I'm like rapping. My friends would like look at the guys who were like rapping in the hallway, like, like what the fuck are y'all doing? Selling drugs was what you did. The cool guys, that's what they did. You might have played sports if you were nice and if you, if you were super nice, you could do both. I just couldn't play basketball. <laughs> But um, college was sort of on the yeah. horizon. Yeah, I went to Norfolk State University for, for, for one year. Okay. And then um, I went to Tidewater Community College. And as I was going to community college, I was coming to New York every, every week at this point, trying to like shop a demo, come in, um, my, me, my brother Pharrell, Chad, running in New York. Um, at this time, I was like taking like anatomy, physiology, and things like the things that you cannot miss school to you know mm -hmm. to uh, to excel in. And um, needless to say, that didn't work. So I dropped out of community college and started pursuing music full time. Yeah, for sure. Okay, when the clips get their first deal, right? Um, things go a little bit awry at Electra, right? Yes. So what went wrong? I think I can safely say that the Clips got their first deal off of the success of the Neptunes production. Okay. And, and not the production that was due to us, production that they did for Old Dirty Bastard or Khalees at the time, or maybe it was Noriega. Yeah. And so, you know, to appease the Neptunes, I believe Sylvia Rohn, who was the CEO, mm -hmm. gave us a deal as well. And, um, you know, we put together this album called Exclusive Audio Footage. I remember watching my video on HBO. The funeral? The funeral video. And soon after watching it on HBO, I found out I was dropped from the label. 
You're about 21 years old? Yes, for sure. Was this dispiriting or frightening in any way? Um, no, we never felt defeated at that time. Um, music was so fun. Music was 100% to totally new to me. My brother, on the other hand, you know, from rap groups with Timbaland, going through the just solo artist thing with Pharrell and Chad, uh, maybe a couple more doors were closed in his face. But man, at that time, it was just get back in the studio, keep creating. It, it was just a great time. I mean, we had, we had, we had first dibs on everything. They had to kill the producer and we had to kill the rappers. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was the whole premise of Lord Willing. So when you get grinding, yeah. finish that in the studio, yeah. did you know instantly this is going to be a, a huge hit record? No way. I realized we had something by my shows. When grinding came out, man, I, I, really, I really did every $1,500 show for every drug dealer in the United States of America. I met every brown bag promoter because they understood the lingo of that song. They understood the cryptic, you know, four and a half will get you in the game. They, they got it off rip. Kids who were just dialing into the beat and loving the dances and whatever the case may be, you know, they just loved it for that. But the guys who were like booking me around the country, Oh man, they loved it a whole nother way. I did birthday parties for people and, and I just performed the song. Me and my brother would perform the song five, ten times. And it would just be 50 people, a neighborhood of just friends and do it again and that's it. And, and I'm like, oh man, like, okay, yeah, y'all get it. Like, they get it. And I did that, we did that for like, man, seven to nine months. When did you know that this was not gonna go down like the funeral? We were on Arista Records at the time. I came to the office one day and happened to stumble upon the was it marketing meeting or radio meeting. L.A. Reid was discussing the records not charting or the records that we had in the lineup not charting. He picked up the media base and said, and this, look at this. He said, this record's been at 70 spins for three weeks and I know we haven't put any money into this. So that means that means that this record got legs of its own. As a matter of fact, that means if this record does not go, I'm firing the staff. And I was grinding. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, like, I was like, oh, this guy's not gonna let us fail. With support from their label and a massive album under their belt, things seemed on track for the clips. But that success would soon come to a grinding halt. So how did your life change when Lord Willing came out and was a success? My life was just, it was amazing. I mean, it was, it was, it was, you know, more notoriety. All I cared about was local fame, you know, and I was locally famous. You have this massive success. Right. Things seem to be going very, you know, according to plan. Right. And then the train sort of derails. Yes. What happened? What happened was the, Record label Arista dissolved and the acts went to Jive. At the time, Jive was a heavy pop label. That led to a four year hiatus. We, we actually got to see the, the, how long a hit record can stretch. After that came the uh, Re-Up Gang mixtape series. And um, ultimately, Hell Hath No Fury. Where in that four year stretch did you get to the point where you started to get either A, really frustrated, or B, really concerned about the state of your career? We got a double XL rating, and I remember the sales. We, we probably did like 120 the first year, I mean, first time with Lord Willing. And then the sales for Hell Hath No Fury were somewhere around 70. I far believed Hell Hath No Fury was 10 times better than Lord Willing, still two to this day. And I could not understand how the critical acclaim did not match up to the commercial success. I was just like, wait a minute. This is where all those disconnects that were happening, you know, affect us basically. Where you don't have the label engaged radio wise, where, you know, the PR wasn't, you know, all the way there. By this time I had got kicked, I had got banned from Jive. 
like the like to physically walk into Jive, I was banned. Why I was, was that? My marketing person at the time at Jive had said it was not important for me to do 106 in Park. I blacked out. I just, I was angry. Man, I like called up there giving terroristic threats. <laughs> and just, you know, I, I mean, that's what it read. That's what it reads. And um, <laughs> I just knew like, this is not how this is supposed to work. How much more comprehensive was your understanding of the business though, when you came out on the other side of this? We were so engulfed in the business of it that we neglected the fans. But as soon as we did start putting out music, and I believe that's when the re Game mixtapes came. To me, that's when we saw the worth of like putting out content, you know, the real internet darlings, being internet darlings. The clips had, we called them clipsters. Like, you know, hipster clips fans or whatever. <laughs> we called them clipsters. And we saw that like, man, there's a whole nother tier and a whole nother level of fan and, and, and medium that people are listening to music through. You know, I remember being angry with Clinton Sparks. I'm like, we got our mixtape, it's all over the internet, but the streets don't know, you know, anything about We Got It For Cheap Volume One. What is the problem? That's me not understanding that like, you know, this wave is a new, something new that's going on right now. And, and Clinton was just like, man, you gotta bear with me, you don't understand. People love it, they're writing about it. I'm like, man, that don't mean nothing to me. I can't go into a mom and pop store and get my mixtape. That means the streets is not getting it. And the streets weren't, they really weren't. But he was just first, he was ahead of his time. So going into the third record, what was your mind state? Because the music that you guys ended up making, the formula was totally different on that one. We were trying to attack bases, like, like we were trying to attack radio here. We were tr with uh, Carrie Hilson. I don't even remember the name of the song. What is the name of that song, Noah? Oh my God. Man, I don't know. But we tried to attack radio with that one. We tried to uh, attack radio with I'm Good. We serviced the streets with Cameron and uh, the clips in Cameron, popular demand. I see, I know that one. He had the A record. Yeah, had uh, and kind of like a big deal. But we were just, we were just trying to flood every audience that we thought was tuned into the clips. We wanted to service each and every one of them. Never had made an album like that in my life. How do you go from there to the breakup of the group? Well, that was 2009. And at the time, everybody that I came into the music business with was indicted on a federal drug charge. These were the people behind the scenes? Everybody, yeah. Every, every friend, every person in the video, it was like nine of them. They were all day one with me and my brother. Just part of, you know, what it is was the makeup of the clips, period. I feel like my brother attributed a lot of what went wrong in the music business to how things turned out for them. At the time, everybody was, you know, we were all making money together. We were all in the music business. When you stop for four years in the music business, you gotta go back to getting money the best way you know how. And those guys were experts. And so then how does that change the group dynamic between you and your brother? Well, I think it hit everybody hard, but I think it hit him a little bit harder because, you know, families are involved, children are involved. I don't have children, you know. He has children, he has children that play with their children. You know, it's different for him. They go to Bible study together, you know. He sees it a little different. I feel like he was over it. Yeah. How did he articulate that to you? Man. He gave me a handwritten book. 
we were on the road and he was like, you wanna be a, you wanna be a solo artist? You should, I think you should, that sh that'll be good for you. And this is what I'm gonna do. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stop rapping, I'm gonna, I'm, but I want you to read my book. And um, that was it. You, you were about to perform together? Yes, 100%. I was in a hotel room. I was in a hotel room going to perform that night. And that was it. What, what, what was your first thought? When... I don't question my brother about anything. He's my older brother. <laughs> like, I don't question him about nothing. Zero. So you um, just, you took the book and... I took the book. I read the book, you know, day for day. And, um, you know, I told him what I thought about it. And um, I don't think I've ever questioned him one time about that. Nowadays, like, we, we just come up on the... 10th anniversary of Hell Half No Fury. You know, offers getting high, hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. to perform top to bottom, let's do 10 cities, whatever. I've just recently got the nerve to ask him, you know, do you want to do it? Or I just tell him like, hey, you know, I don't want to like, I'm just telling you like, you talking about 800 bands right now. <laughs> like, you know. That's where it's stopping. We ain't even sold no merch yet or nothing, though, but you know where it can go. And then he says, no, I don't want to do it. And I'm like, okay. At this point, are, you know, are you concerned? Are you worried about what this means for your career? For some reason, I always just felt I would get a shot. And I just always thought I would just go solo and I will be a professional rap artist on a major label going solo. I never had the thought that I wasn't going to, you know, be able to put out a solo album or three. What was the strategy for you to get from clips coming off of a lukewarm record, mm -hmm. the group dissolves, it's kind of, things are a little murky, Yeah. to get from there to Pusha T on Def Jam, you know, solo artist? Um, well, the, the process was after that murky, record till the casket drops soon after that man i think kanye or don c somebody loved my freedom verse from till the casket dropped and, <laughs> and um they reached out for me to come to hawaii my beautiful dark twisted fantasy time um good friday time when you're out there working on this record, mm -hmm. did you have any sense that this relationship was going to go any further than simply helping him with Twisted Fantasy? Yeah. I mean, I knew I was going to like the guy. I knew that he was decent. He was like a decent individual. I've never had someone open up an album to me that was theirs. Like, he was like, hey, this is my album. I like how you rap. You can write to anything on this album. And, you know, if it's great, it's great. If it's not, it's not. But, you know, you can have it all here. Take it. So, gorgeous. All these great records I'm just writing verses for. Now, mind you, we're in, we're in Hawaii. The day starts off early. We play basketball every morning. We eat breakfast together every day. It got to the point, once I realized that he was, like, really letting me do what I want, like like really write to his whole album, to everything I thought was great. I skipped basketball every day. I stopped eating breakfast with everybody. I didn't, y'all can go do that. This is what I'm gonna do. I'm like, this is what I'm gonna do. And that turned into seven verses. We got trimmed down to two, Runaway and Soul Appalled which is fine. <laughs> I was good. Two out of seven is great. How did he broach, you know, you joining good music? Oh, he just kind of said it. He was like, oh man, you know, yeah, you're here now. So, you know, you know, trying to get a record deal is, is usually a long winded situation. You're going back and forth. And it's sort of different when it's with Kanye West because it's like, he just was really like, yo, what do you need? You know, just tell them what you need. Let that happen over there. Let us just go create over here. 
Kanye saw the potential for Pusha to be more than an artist and soon recruited him to a permanent position within his inner circle. How do you go from having that conversation, joining the label, to then becoming the president of the label? He respects my opinion. I'm super opinionated about everything when it comes to the music. Um, I feel like we're a team over there. People are super uh, critical of good music, and especially of him. And I think in regards to that, when articulating everything that has to do with us, period. And I'm thinking about everybody. I'm thinking about us as a whole. I'm thinking about, you know, the whole team. Sean, whoever. If it's their time, then it's their time, and that's what we speak on. I just try to give the most objective and the, the best opinions. You are unflinchingly honest in, with Kanye, with all the artists that you deal with. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in an environment with people who have egos, who are artists, who are exposing themselves, who have, you know, some insecurity around that. How do you couch that in a way that your feedback is received, you know, positively and doesn't sting? Well, I feel like everybody understands that it, nothing is coming from a malicious place. With me, I admire damn near everybody on the label. There's nothing that I haven't asked from all of them at some particular point. So it's not that I think that any one person is lacking in some capacity or if I say something, it's like I'm picking on somebody. No, I, I just speak what, I feel like I'm the most outside artist on good music as far as I'm the actual person who's actually in the club, I'm actually in the street, I'm actually, I'm through all of the mixes. I am. So when you take the helm of President of Good Music, mm -hmm. what was your personal goal for that position? My personal goal for, for Good Music was just to make sure that those releases that could come out on time could come out. You know, Sean's an independent super independent artist. He's gonna do his thing regardless. He's gonna go. You know, when you have things like Pablo, you can't, can't control that at all. And, and I'm saying that being a person that like, he'll call and say, hey, come to New York. Let's listen to Pablo down. Let's, let's tell me what you think. Let's, let's put this in order. And we get down to 12 songs and everybody's high-fiving and we leave and we wake up in the morning, it's back at 19 songs again. <laughs> and, you know, you can't control that though. Me, I mean, me personally, I can't control that. That's, that's him and that's his, that's his art and that's his thing. You know, when you reflect on the last few years running the label, yeah. what is the achievement you're the most proud of? Seeing designer really come of age People seem to forget designer is 19 years old. You know, he was probably 17 when he made that record. 16 million singles to date. This kid is from Brooklyn, raw energy, melodic, watching that success, like watching that happen for him and, and hopefully watching it grow into something else. You know, I feel like this is phase one of him. It's just, it's just watching that play out and watching him play out and watching him get the looks he's gotten. That's my calling in hip hop. I never want to be like the greats that I looked up to in regards to embracing new energy, new hip hop, new sub genres of the genre. I never want to be that guy because I feel like all the greats that I loved, except for maybe two, aren't here because they didn't embrace new young energy. And I think they were very dismissive and very critical and hypercritical and, you know, this ain't how it was in the 80s we had to, or the 90s had to be like, or the 2000s had to, like, they all kept that energy. And that, that's not an energy for growth. So if I'm a young artist aspiring to get on, mm -hmm. why do I want to sign to good music? You want to sign to good music because, A, the artistic freedom. We don't hold you back at all in any capacity. The mere notion of signing to good music and being able to work in the group of creatives that is in our fold is second to none. 
it's a creative amusement park, period. Like if you're if you're about creativity and you're about being great and, and, and doing exactly what it is that you want and you know how to articulate that and make us believe, we can make the world believe. You're coming up on about 20, 21 years in the music industry now. Yes. You reflect back on that time, a lot of artists have come and gone. Right. And while you may not have had some of the super peaks right. that those artists have had, you have had the longevity that almost none of them have. What are the attributes that you think are most sort of important to that sustaining that success? Sustaining success has a lot to do with creative consistency to me. People know what they're getting from the Pusha T brand. Like I feel like I haven't missed any one thing that has happened. And I think I've been a part of every era in some capacity. And, and even if I wasn't active, I was still out and knowing what was going on. And I was still looking at it and seeing where I could insert myself into it. How can I compete with the new rhyme patterns? How do you compete with that? How do you step up your, your personal rhyme patterns to even compete with that? I feel like I've carved out a lane in my ear. You either love a Pusha T song or you hate it, but you, you know it's a Pusha T song. Nine times out of 10, people don't even choose those beats to rap over. Would never choose those beats to rap over. When you think about being the president of this label and, right. and being, you know, an, an industry player, what are the attributes about your personality that you think are the most important to the success there? Honesty. Honesty. I don't, I don't lie to anyone about anything in regards to their career, in regards to their music. If I'm not into it, I'm not into it. If I don't like it, if I think you're moving wrong, I'm gonna tell you. And if you are receptive to that, we will have the best relationship ever because my transparency is my gift. I can give you, I'm, I'm gonna tell you everything I know. I'm gonna tell you everything I know. I'm gonna tell you all of the truths. I'm not gonna nickname it. I don't know how to deal in that type of business and like, you know, telling half truths and lying about business because it's so near and dear to me. Like, this business takes care of everything. It takes care of my family, other people's families. I don't toy with that.